but it's you know my problem with cancel culture at the moment is i'm slightly suspicious it might be the new burning books and and whereas we're very um arrogant in our secular culture of our achievements religion does certain things better uh, religion religion has a road for redemption and um mm -hmm. and, and forgiveness a yeah, Forgive yeah redemption are very underrated in the world of, of cancel culture confession um, as well right what sorry? i mean that's a well confession is a key element in psychotherapy yeah and that's what you basically do in psychotherapy you say here's all the things i'm doing that might be stupid and hurtful or the things that have happened to me that's also a possibility but it's often the former that are more useful so yeah how come you haven't been cancelled i have several several times uh, i i was uh i was i had a uh, tax scandal that nearly ended my career i've had maybe four or five jokes over the years that have become a, a problems uh you know the papers it's it's an interesting thing when it happens when the first time it happens to you it's very shocking because you think oh my god i could i, I found this incredible road i found this life of being a comedian and i could lose it all in an instant and that is uh, terrifying and then you realize it's it's kind of okay it's like you you go well, everything doesn't fall away the people that like you like you the people that don't like you have a stick to beat you with and it's it's often when things are taken out of context when jokes are taken out of context like i'm telling jokes in theaters to a paying audience of an evening people have come to see me they've bought into it i'm not shouting them through someone's letterbox at 8 a.m in the morning as they're eating their cornflakes but that's what happens when it turns up in the newspaper and if you've seen a joke written down you haven't heard the joke there's a dialogue, there's an interaction with the audience, there's, there's a difference between seeing the words that were in that joke and hearing that joke and experiencing that joke in the same way. Well, that's probably true for the most daring jokes, you know, because when you're in a live theater and you say something that's right on the edge, right? Yeah. It's hilariously funny, it's because you're carried away with the moment, you get this witty idea and bang, you nail it, but that sort of, and that's right at the edge of what's permissible. You take well, that is, out of context, it's a catastrophe. Here's the thing again, you know, you can you can joke about anything, but not with anyone, you, you know? Yeah, that's for sure. My audience is not the same as your audience. So if you go on the, if we, if we both decided, right, we're gonna do a show together and, your audience came to the show and I opened for you. I did 10 minutes at the top. I don't think they would love it. It's like, it, it's a different, so there'd, there'd be overlap. There'd be some people that would, but some people wouldn't, you know, it's, a, it's, we all, we attract our own audiences to come to the show. And the idea that you go suddenly, then your jokes are held up uh, to the scrutiny of everyone on social media. And the loudest voices are the ones that ring out are the, are the negative voices. And there's something there's something a bit disingenuous about the press as well, where they'll report a joke. Yeah, as if, a bit. <laughs> as if, well, but they report a joke as if you're making a statement. And I don't really make yeah, well, statements on stage. I make jokes. So you go, well, the, the defense is always, it was a joke. Well, what, do you, what do you think the relationship is between jokes and the truth? I think, and it's very interesting. I think it was um, Bertram Russell that said when something is funny, Search it very carefully for a hidden truth. A, a yeah, joke. yeah. Well, do comedians often say things that everybody thinks are true, but no one will dare to yeah. say. I, I, I think comedy lives uh, at its best somewhere between, well, it lives between public and private discourse. And there's a huge difference between public and private discourse. Certainly at the moment, Certainly. it feels like it's never been wider. If you watch uh, BBC. So comedians are even more necessary. Yes, but uh, yes, I'm building my role. But uh, you know, the idea if you watch BBC News, you would you would swear that everyone thinks in the same way and thinks the same thing about everything. And actually, there's a huge variety of opinion out there. And so different people go down different rabbit holes into their own media, but you go, there's a lot. Of, and comedians are kind of in the middle trying to make sense of it all and talking to an audience. And everything a comedian says has to be based in the level of honesty, because it just isn't funny. So, if you're joking, yeah, it's so strange though, because there are truths, there are truths that aren't funny. So, what's what is it about truth? What is it about some truths that make them funny? What is exactly the relationship? Because funny is a subset of true in some sense. Um, so, yeah, well, well, I don't think a joke needs to be needs to be true per se. It just needs to 
often the funniest thing is when you're pointing something out that's the uh, akin to the emperor's new clothes. Yeah, yeah. You're pointing out something that kind of it seems obvious when you say it, but and everyone kind of goes, "Oh yeah, I guess that's." Oh so yeah, or they go, "Oh well, oh yeah, we're all like that." Ha ha ha. We know that. Yeah, so would say it. Yeah, observational comedy does that job of kind of going. You know, we, we've all had this human experience, and if you're talking about something that's slightly more transgressive in society, it's like it's talking openly about it. So there's a there's a sense in which it mimics friendship because it's having a conversation that you, you're not walking on eggshells. So political correctness at a comedy show is like health and safety at the rodeo. It just doesn't it doesn't sort of belong there. It's not to say that political correctness is is a is a bad thing. It's just saying it's about the application. Where does that work? I mean, I, I'm not. I think the obsession with words with linguistics in PC is I don't give a fuck what you call me. I care how you treat me. So I'm I'm very interested in social justice, but I'm not interested at all in political correctness. And I think the two are being conflated because it's an easier fight to win. That the you know the straw man is the language. It, it avoids having to talk about the real topic a lot of the time. Yeah, it might also avoid having to confront those particular demons in your own soul as well. So that's a powerful form of avoidance. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so, you know, one more question. We, we've gone about 90 minutes. And, and so why did you want to talk to me today? Why, why did you think that was a good idea? And, and what sparked your interest? I'm, I'm curious I mean, I, about that. I, I was, uh, I think you're an incredibly interesting guy because I think there's a, uh, there's a sense in which what you're trying to do uh, certainly in 12 rules, but I think, you know, maps of meaning as well, I think is such a valuable, you know, you're reaching out, you are a, a, a father figure for a lot of uh, men without fathers. That's the, it strikes me that that's a incredibly uh, difficult station to, to take. And you, you've been given, uh, I think, a, you know, a, a very hard time, I think, for, for trying to do something that's incredibly valuable and necessary. And I think in trying to write my book, I, I discovered that I wanted to try and give something back a little bit. I wanted to try and help in some small way. Partly it was about being a father and it was about having that energy as a father of going, look, if something happened to me tomorrow, what am I leaving my son? What do I, you know, so from my kind of ego point of view, saying, well, what do I want to, what do I think about how the world works? And I felt that my book was something that you would respond to uh, because it, it, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a it's a much more, I mean, I kind of went down the self-help route because I thought it was low-hanging fruit in some sense. You know, yourself and ha Sam Harris are great, but you neither of you know your way around a dick joke. And I felt like <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which, you know, of delivering that material with a lightness uh, that, that's, that it feels like your audience might, might get a kick out of, out of my book. Uh, so I suppose it was, kind of, you know, okay. self-interest, but also... I like what you've done. Well, thank you. That's I thought, you know, especially you know, I like what you've done too. I think you're extremely funny. And is that actually your laugh? Yeah, it's it's, it's Oh my funny. god, that's so horrible. Well, yeah, I mean it's well, <laughs> wonderful because it's it's that thing where it's a very very distinctive laugh. But I think I think a laugh got me into comedy because uh, my mother's laugh, she had a she had narcolepsy. She had a thing called cataplexy which is a bit of narcolepsy where you lose muscular control. So when she laughed, you often meet someone that makes no noise when they laugh. So she had a very extreme version of that where she would properly kind of just melt when she laughed. So obviously I was massively motivated to make her laugh. Like if she was driving when I was a kid, if you could make her laugh in the car, you'd have to grab the wheel and kind of steer because she'd kind of collapse in giggles, properly collapse. And it's, uh, I don't know, I've always been very, I, I like strange laughs. I think they're, uh, they're quite magnificent. Infectious. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, well, look, I really enjoyed talking to you. I'm coming to the UK. I'm going to Cambridge and Oxford. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. there for the last two weeks in, in November. And I have a couple of talks. Maybe I could shoot you over an invitation. I would, I would love to come. I mean, you know, I work every night, but if they're, they're during the day, I'd love to come and see you speak. And I'd love to see... You know what what the reaction is but i think it's i think now as well the looking at something like 12 rules now 
Um, look, I, I really think there's a hunger now post pandemic. People have been locked away for 18 months and they've had sort of, we've come out of this collective hibernation and it's right, what am I going to do next? What's my plan? Like everyone's had that chance to kind of go, right, what's the next step? What's the, and people are searching for, for a little bit of, uh, of guidance. And I think when you look at, you know, some of the things that you talk about, certainly in, in, in maps of meaning, the, the idea that, myth and story and you know the, the kind of Jungian archetypes of the term I would use it, you know they're so important and they're so sort of interesting in our in our culture because we've kind of slightly thrown the baby out of the bathwater. 